Um, I may be in a somewhat unique position because I will frequently um, represent compassion and choices. I'm also a member of that organization. Uh, but today I'm officially representing uh, Final Exit Network and uh, I can address some of the questions you had earlier as well. <coughs> I don't want to steal their thunder because I very strongly believe in what they're doing. I support them. I was actually called to testify at the Minnesota Senate on behalf of Compassion and Choices and we'll get into that. So a um, little bit about my background. Uh, I have a master's degree in counseling. Uh, I did a postgraduate residency at the Sioux Falls VA Hospital where I specialized in working with veterans with PTSD and I became a critical incident stress management certified counselor which basically means I'm one of the people when there's a bomb threat they call me to help calm people down. Um, so I, I also worked at Sanford Hospital in Sioux Falls when I was at the VA there. Since then I've worked as a mental health uh, counselor at Mercy Hospital and I am currently with Heartland Hospice. And now I'm preparing for the booze because my title in those places was chaplain. Currently, I have four simultaneous careers. Um, I am a business communications consultant, which is a fancy way of saying I'm a technical writer and trainer. I did that for 30 some years and at the age of 50, I couldn't decide whether to buy a motorcycle or have an affair, so I went to seminary. <laughs> Three years later, I had my master's degree in, in interfaith spiritual counseling, and my people are the people who say I'm spiritual but not religious. That's my people. Uh, because of my stress management, I found myself having veterans coming to me after they got out of the hospital saying, you know, we like what you're doing, so I do stress management. Because I'm a hospice chaplain, I do grief counseling, and to me, the whole thing is about emotional intelligence. It's about self-awareness. So, um, oh, and there's the boo. All together now, boo, has to talk. <laughs> Compassion and Choices and Final Exit, ne Final Exit Network has a shared lineage. We both started out as the Hemlock Society in 1980. Uh, I don't know all the details, you can look this up online, but at some point they became End of Life Choices, 2003. At some point, various factions organized and got together. They called themselves Compassion and Dying Federation in 2004. And then they split up. And the reason they split up was so that they could focus on what they do best. Compassion and Choices focuses on legislative change. Working behind the scenes, working in politics. I ran for St. Paul City Council, never again. <coughs> I'd rather sit down with my patients. <laughs> so I totally support what they're doing. Final Exit Network, uh, we don't, I mean, we're all supportive of it, and many of us are members of both organizations. But our purpose is to provide compassionate support to people who are going through the self-deliverance conversation and process. Who we are, the network. We are 3,000 and growing members. Very cheap membership, like 50 bucks. Uh, we are 70 plus volunteers right now, with including these professions. Some of you may be surprised. There are physicians and psychiatrists, and I'm not the only ordained clergy who is a member of this group. I'm, I'm one of the core members of the group, but uh, there are others like us. Uh, Derek Humphrey is the grandfather of the movement. He was a journalist, uh, is still alive, he was a journalist, uh, he's British, and he wrote the book Jean's Way, Jean was his wife, and he helped her end her life and wrote the book about it. Sometime after that, I don't know the dates, he wrote the book Final Exit, and it became a New York Times bestseller because it got such bad reviews. <laughs> if you, if you know, there's no, nothing like bad PR to get people to go to your movie or whatever. He was the founder of the Hemlock Society, and then it, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it morphed, and then at some point, he and the other founders of the Hemlock Society that had been brought into the Compassion and Choice of Larger Umbrella, left, and I think he's still a member of Compassion Choices, but I don't know that for a fact, but basically they wanted to do more hands-on work with the people. Um, he is still an advisor uh, on our advisory board, and he is also the past president of the World Federation of Right to Die Societies, which is in 24 countries. So we're not the only people having this conversation. He lives today appropriately enough in Eugene, Oregon, where the whole Right to Die thing got started. This is his book. And whoever was over here that first mentioned self-delivery, thank you for bringing that up today. 
It is called The Practicalities of Self-Deliverance and Assisted Suicide for the Dying. And yes, we use the word assisted suicide. The reason there is a mental stigma or social stigma around there is because of the last four, four letters. Homicide, genocide, whatever, suicide. They, somebody somewhere has decided that it is a crime. So we don't like to talk about it because it's a crime. It's, you're committing something. No, I'm ending my suffering. I'm not committing anything. So that's, that's kind of where we're coming from. I found this out there. This happens to be your British counterpart, British Humanist Association. We have long supported attempts to legalize assisted dying, assisted suicide, and volunteer euthanasia. I don't know when this was written, but it's been around. For those who have made a clear decision, free from coercion, to end their lives, and who are physically unable to do so themselves. So whoever mentioned, what if I can't do it? Uh, in many cases, the person in question will be terminally ill. However, we do not think that there is a strong moral case to limit assistance to terminally ill people. Final Exit Network tries to fill that void. These, do you, anybody know people who are suffering from any of these things? You would not be eligible for the legislation of Compassion and Choices is trying to move. I personally have a stepfather who has dementia. He's been dead for five years. He just doesn't know it. And my mother doesn't know it either. She keeps trying to remind him that she's his wife and not his mother. And we can't say, Mom, you're just confusing him, and she doesn't get it. So anyway, these people who suffer from this are not covered by Compassion and Choices. And I totally get that they have to start someplace. So they're starting with what they think they can get past. The difference between Final Exit Network and the other organizations is you do not need to be terminally ill. You do not have to have a medical diagnosis that says that if this disease runs its course, it will, you will be dead in six months. And that is the legal qualification for hospice care. We support research into other peaceful means for self-deliverance. We are a completely volunteer organization. Nobody is paid. And we are, to, to my knowledge, we are the only organization that has completely open election for board members. There are no certifications, education required. You just have to have a passion for it and show that you can argue the case. Our mission, we offer free services to anybody who wants them, but you do have to qualify. Uh, we want to erase the awareness of this because we consider this a basic human right. Because who owns your body? You do. Period. End of the conversation. We want to foster new research into peaceful and reliable ways to self-deliver. Very strongly promoting advanced directives. If you don't have one, I want you to have one by the end of Monday. And I'll call you. <laughs> and we will go to court on your behalf if necessary. Requirements. You do have to apply. You have to become a member. You can do both of those things with a phone call. And if 50 bucks pushes you over the edge, give me a call. We'll work something out. We do not want that to be a limitation. You must be interviewed by an exit guide. Very in-depth training, uh, exit guides. Uh, I am uh, in process of that. I have a master's degree, and I still have to prove to them that I know what I'm doing. So you're not going to get somebody off the street who says, hey, I want to do this because it sounds fun and I get my name in the paper. That's not going to work. So it's a very in-depth process to become an exit guide. You have to supply a written personal statement of your reasons for wanting a hastening death. That doesn't mean that we will say that's not a good reason. We just want to make sure you've thought it through. And you must provide relevant medical records, including a diagnosis. And I'll tell you a little, let you in on a little dirty secret. We got snookered. There was a woman who claimed to have this, this, and this disease. Somebody got in a hurry. Somebody fell asleep at the switch, whatever you want to call it. We helped her in the process. She did take her own life. And then we found out that all that stuff she made up. So we revised our requirements. You have to provide documentation that, yes, you have been diagnosed with whatever disease you say you have. The thing is, we simply want to make sure that you are understanding of and have explored all of your options. What is the process? The process is your individual needs and your timetable will be totally up to you. 
and your exit guide or your family. We will work with you on the phone. You will receive information for the means to end your suffering, what is appropriate for you in your condition, uh, what you're comfortable doing. We'll discuss all of the options. And there are some uh, costs involved, very minor costs involved, uh, and you must purchase these things yourself. So in order for us to continue doing this, we cannot legally touch anything. We found that out the hard way. What will we do? We very, very carefully screen anybody who's a, who applies. We do provide counseling. I believe all of the counselors have to have at least a master's degree and some experience. And we will support your decision, and I want to make this very clear. Whether you change your mind or not, doesn't matter what your decision is. Each of us is committed to supporting the decision you make. Even if we think, if, if, if I think, if I were in your position, hey, I'd check out tomorrow. That's not my decision, it's your decision. So we are committed to supporting whatever decision you and your family make. What we will not do, we will not encourage you to end your life. Religion or not, we all do consider that life to be sacred by whatever definition you want to call sacred. Um, but we will not also provide the means to end your life. We can direct you to the resources, but we will not physically provide them. And we will not provide any physical assistance. Now, physical assistance can be wishy-washy because an exit, wide, an exit guide will be at your bedside and hold your hand until your last breath. You can call that, maybe you could call that physical assistance. But we won't give you any medication, we won't push any plungers, we won't turn any knobs. All we will do is hold your hand if you want us there. There is a window of opportunity. We touched on this a bit. If you have a dementia or other or Alzheimer's or other kind of dementia, there will come a point when you can long, no longer make these decisions. If you have a neuromuscular degeneration that may lead to your paralysis or severe atrophy, you may no longer be able to self-administer. People who have Parkinson's, for example, and dementia, those people may choose to self-deliver before anybody knows they have those conditions because that's when they can make the decisions for themselves. People ask me why I don't support hospice more. I'm a hospice chaplain. I do support hospice. But it doesn't cover all the cases. First of all, you do have to have the medical diagnosis from a doctor that says you're going to die in six months if this disease takes its expected course. The other thing is you don't know what the corporate philosophy of that hospice is. Are there any Catholic organizations that have hospice underneath there? Are there any religious institutions that have hospice underneath them? I do know somebody over here who was a social worker said that yes, it's a Catholic institution, but they respect, um, they will respect uh, healthcare directives. I'm wondering if they will respect right to die legislation. I wonder if they would respect literal assisted suicide because they have their own charter. And the people who put them on the map, their stockholders or whatever you want to call it, they have to answer to them. I'm not saying they're wrong, they just have, they may have a bigger picture. And the other thing is the organization that your insurance is currently under today, next week might be owned by a religious organization. Everything could change. You just have to be very aware of what the hospice answers to. What higher authority do they answer to? Now I'm not talking that higher authority, you know, whatever. So, or that higher authority, however you want to put it. The opposition in the shadows. I had a bunch of slides here that I talk about why people oppose uh, compassion choices and all that. And there are usually four main secular uh, objections, and we talked about you know, the slippery slope, and, and I can get into that. But first of all, no, 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 no. The, the slippery slope, a lot of things. Less than 1% of all of the people who get medications use them. The ones who don't use them, they always say, having them there makes me feel better helps me to cope with the end of my life better. They never actually use them. And the fact of the matter is, believe it or not, the suicide rate among aid in dying states is lower than the other ones. 
It's because there is a sense of hope, a sense of peace, a sense of autonomy and dignity. So the number one, uh, uh, or one of the four main objections is about the slippery slope, and it simply doesn't apply. And by the way, if you ever take an ethics class, slippery slope has been debunked by ethicists everywhere. There's no such argument as slippery slope. It's, it's bogus. Uh, the other, th uh, well, we'll get into the other things. But one of the main things is here. This is a little graph. It actually compares 1976 to 1988 because I couldn't find one without the comparison. But what this shows is 30% of all Medicare spending is done in the last year of life. 50% of that is in the last 30 days. I have to read something because I keep forgetting how all this stuff. And I'm quoting for somebody who was in a similar venue. There is opposition in the shadows. Dying people are the single largest cash cow in the healthcare industry. Billions of dollars would be denied to healthcare industry if a significant number of dying people, note that they're already dying, chose to minimize their suffering by hastening their death. Knowing what we all know about some of the predatory practices among insurance companies and the healthcare industry, it is virtually impossible for me not to conclude that certain elements in that industry use their influence to oppose aid in dying. That's my soapbox. Now, I'm sure you guys don't like to get into religious conversations. I don't, and I'm an ordained chaplain. I want to give you some ammunition. The people who do oppose on religious grounds, number one, the Catholic Church, and the thing they use is this idea of redemptive suffering. Fundamentalists of all brands will jump on that bandwagon. Even Orthodox Judaism, but they don't come from the same angle. Most of the time they say it thwarts the will of God. As a hospice chaplain who has worked in many ER rooms, including intensive care, I say, you called 911. You thwarted the will of God. You took a vitamin this morning. You thwarted the will of God. Anything you do that's got any man-made anything involved is thwarting the will of God. Try another argument. The religious response, the whole idea of redemptive suffering, they're talking about this thing, and my colleagues later on may get into this, they're talking about this thing called atonement theory. If you grew up Bible type like I did, it's basically the idea that Jesus died for your sins. Well, if you really read the scriptures, he suffered and died for your sins. So if you believe that he died for your sins, then he also suffered for your sins. The idea that your suffering somehow brings you closer to God is not pious, it's sadistic. There should be no reason any religious person, faith, any faith, should encourage anybody to suffer for any reason whatsoever. And this is the big surprise to a lot of people. People say, what about the Sixth Commandment? I learned it as thou shalt not kill, and that is not correct. There is absolutely nothing in the Christian or Jewish scripture about suicide or assisted suicide. The Sixth Commandment that we learned as thou shalt not kill is a bad translation. It very specifically says thou shalt not murder. And murder is very specifically defined as the deliberate taking of another's life with malice. Okay? If you are giving your life, I'm not taking it. You can only take something if someone's not giving it to you. You receive something that, that is being given. See the distinction there? So if I give you something, you're not taking it, you're receiving it. And it has to be another's life. So suicide, it's actually not against God's law, by whatever definition. And with malice, any time you are doing something that somebody asks you to do, there's no malice. You're helping them out. So the whole argument about Sixth Commandment, I'm sorry, but it's pretty much not applicable. Final Exit Network has been involved in three lawsuits, and we are currently involved in one right now in Minnesota. Uh, it goes back to Arizona. First one is in 2007. Uh, that ended in 2011. We had a one in Georgia, 2009 to 2012. At that time, the Final Exit Network was uh, headquartered in Marietta, Georgia, where I used to live. 
and I point out these years, 2007, 11, et cetera, I could just say in 2011 we won, in 2012 we won, but I wanted to point out how long it took. 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 9, 10, 11, 12. There's seven years caught up in courts and all the, all the costs and all the money. And guess who wins anytime you go to court? The court. Judges and lawyers are the only people who win when you go to court. All that money spent. So, Arizona, not guilty. Georgia, not guilty. Minnesota. I'm going to read again because I don't like to misquote. In 2007, Doreen Dunn of Apple Valley, Minnesota underwent, no, I'm sorry, in 1996, Doreen Dunn of Apple Valley, Minnesota underwent a medical procedure. It was botched. It left her in constant pain. In 2007, she died. The coroner ruled it coronary artery disease. Well, somebody in Georgia, back in this time, they had done a sting of the uh, Final Exit Network office. And all those papers were still laying around. So then Minnesota comes along and someone in the Georgia Bureau of Investigation is seeing these communications between this lady in Minnesota and Final Exit Network. They called Minnesota and said, you might want to check this out. They made some phone calls and found out that sure enough, um, she took her own life. And she did so using the methods that were uh, brought to her through the final exit book. So the uh, prosecutor of Dakota County uh, took final exit network to court, claiming that we assisted with her suicide. Ne we never lifted a finger. Believe it or not, they ruled that because we told her about the existence of the website where she could buy the book, we assisted her suicide. The ACLU is now on our side because they, the court made it a free speech issue. That case is going on right now. I expect to be testifying there sometime in September or October. Both sides have vowed to take it all the way to the Supreme Court. So that's what's going on legally. Faith Riverstone is a current Minnesota resident. She struggled with progressively worsening brain function and loss of strength for six years. It was a mystery to her. What's going on with my body and my brain? I don't understand it. She was finally diagnosed with both early onset dementia and a muscle weakening autoimmune condition called myasthenia gravis. I have no idea if I'm pronouncing that right or not. By the time she is within six months of her death, she will not be of sound mind and chances are she will be paralyzed. She will not be able to end her own suffering. We cannot help her because we're in a current lawsuit, we're under a gag order. So she had to go to North Carolina so that she could talk to somebody about her options. So that's what's happening. Uh, this is the book Final Exit, as I mentioned earlier. There is a DVD. The difference on the DVD is that on the DVD you get to actually watch Derek Humphrey demonstrating the methods that he is suggesting for self-deliverance. Question, sir? Uh, one of those methods is not really available anymore, and that is the helium. You might want to address that. It is still available, but you simply can't buy the pre-made bag. You can always make your own. And you can still go to a party store and buy a, two tanks of helium. Whoops. As long as they sell balloons and kids' circuses stuff, you can buy a tank of helium. What he's talking about is one of the methods is involves basically putting a plastic bag over your head, but it's not suffocation. What it does is it replaces the oxygen with helium, and within maybe 30 to 60 seconds, you will go into a coma, and then your brain function will cease and then you will, you will uh, self-deliverance will happen within a matter of moments and there is absolutely no pain because the first thing that happens is your pain receptors go away. Um, because of the lawsuit and because of all that, uh, I don't know who is actually making those custom-made bags, but they're no longer available. But you can see a picture of how to make one yourself. You can go to a grocery store and get a turkey baking breast, you know, the turkey what do you call them, turkey bags or whatever? Same thing. So it's, it's a how-to. I'm sorry, it's a how-to. 
They also do describe, though, these are all the medications you could use. These are their side effects. This is how you can take them so you minimize the side effects. Um, it's basically a catalog, and then you pick the method that will work for you. So Final Exit is the book and the DVD is out there. I would also highly recommend this book, To Die Well. I like the fact that it was written by two doctors. The subtitle is Your Right to Comfort, Calm, and Choice in the Last Days of Life. This is the website. I just want to make you aware that it is out there. Uh, I do not know if that's a 24-7. At the very least, it's an answered, uh, answering machine. A lot of information out there. You can look at the history. Uh, to my knowledge, Derek Humphrey will still respond to questions directly to him. Um, so a lot of information out there. One thing I do want to draw you to is one, one benefit of becoming a member of Final Exit Network is you also become a member of the U.S. Living Will Registry. How many of you do have a living will? Okay, roughly half of you. I worked in a lot of ERs, as I mentioned. If your living will is not on file in the hospital where you are at, it doesn't matter. And sometimes if it's not on file in the ER where you are, it doesn't matter. They have to go look it up. And by then, you got tubes on your throat and you're up in ICU, and your family ends up paying that bill. But if you become a member of the U.S. Living Will Registry, you get a wallet card. And the ER staff will go through your wallet, I'm sorry, but they're going through your wallet to find who you are, who can we contact. And they run across this card and they go, oh, they have an online living will. Boom, it's online. Become a member of Final Exit Network and we throw this in. Whether or not you choose to ever become a, ex uh, a member of Final Exit Network, I highly suggest you check this out and get yourself a, a, an online living will. Um, so that no matter what ambulance takes you wherever, they can always say, yep, here it is, and you don't have to worry about the paperwork. What can you do? It's been mentioned before, and I'll harp on it all day long. Support the organizations that are doing this. Whatever they are doing, you know, the compassion and choices. I mean, folks, we're in Iowa. <laughs> It's baby steps, baby steps. It took them years to get this in Oregon. And California, of all places, just got it passed. I grew up calling California the land of fruit flakes and nuts. By the way, I'm from Fairmont, Minnesota originally, just up northways. So, I mean, it took this long for California to get through. And so they got to take baby steps. Maybe, maybe my grandchildren will be around when we're truly openly talking about this, you know, downtown rather than a place like this. So... Support the organizations, whatever they're doing and wherever they are. Get a copy, read it, see what it's all about, see if it works for you. Do your durable power of attorney, healthcare directive, do it now. And whoever said talk to your family, thank you. It is the most important and the most difficult conversation you will ever have. As a hospice chaplain, the closer you get to the end, the harder this is. Talk to them now. On a personal note, uh, how long has it been since Robin Williams took his life? Two years? Okay. My background is mental health. I've worked with a lot of depression, PTSD. Uh, my son came back from Afghanistan with PTSD, which is one of the reasons I went that direction. Um, when Robin Williams uh, took his own life, one of the talking heads on network TV called him a coward. And it wasn't the first time that someone who had committed suicide was accused of taking the coward's way out. The Facebook, Twitter chatter that came up, a lot of stuff, but one struck, and I, oh, I wish to this day I had written down who this was, but somebody wrote, if you think about the incredible stories of survival, Auschwitz survival, death camp survival, prisoner of war survivals, the basic human will to live is probably the single most powerful force ever. Can you imagine how strong something has to be to overwhelm that? So, when Robin Williams, uh, celebrities always get it, but for me it's returning veterans. 
um, addicts. Anytime somebody is known to be suffering from depression and they finally end it, I don't care how they do it, I refuse to judge them. Instead, I go, wow, you dealt with that for how long? That is our motto. My life, my death, my choice. It is your life, it is your death, we believe it should be your choice, nobody else. I totally support compassion and choices, but I do not think this is a decision that, you, that should be made between you and your doctor. I think this is a decision that your doctor should support, but it's your decision. It is not your doctor's decision. So the whole thing about the relationship between, no, no. This is your decision. Your doctor doesn't get to make that decision for you. It's, it's my opinion. That's me. That's my company name. There's a whole spiritual thing behind it we can get into later. But if you have any questions, email me, call me anytime. Um, I tried to address some of the questions that we're talking about compassion and choices because I work in that arena also. Um, anybody have any questions? Yes, sir. It's not a question so much as a comment, but you know, when you said about the, the coward thing, uh, my mom committed suicide when I was 17. A lot of people said it was a selfish act. Yeah. Like what you said, and I can think you can do it the same way because she did care about me, you know, my family. Sure. Care about others, and despite that, what must it have been like to still be? Sure. So, so, oh my God, how, how strong would that have to be to overcome your love for your children? Right. You know, those of us who haven't been there simply cannot judge. Yes, ma'am. Um, I'd like to make a comment just addressing uh, the verbiage that you're using. One of the things, you mentioned the stigma attached to suicide. Yes. The side at the end. Also, with committing suicide. Yep. I like to say achieving self-deliverance because yeah. we're, hey, we're a society of achievers, right? Any other questions? Yes? I have a couple of questions um, related to the mental health aspect of all of this. Okay. So what kind of psychiatric and psychosocial evaluations do you put your clients through to ensure that is not a mental health issue that could be addressed and resolved through psychiatric care, medication, counseling. I'm also wondering about your counseling if you have a client who lives in an area where you don't have trained counselors, how does that person actually get face-to-face -face counseling so that there can be a complete psychosocial assessment? Uh, you're here? talking about Final Exit Network or my personal? Final Exit they will go wherever we go, wherever we go. They travel. Okay, they travel. Okay. Yeah. So then what about my other aspect of that in terms of the kind of, if at all, mental well, health assessments that these people go through? Yeah first, of all, yeah, first of all, I don't believe in management by policy. I think every case is different. Mm -hmm. um, and so anytime they say, well, this is well, how you do it, well, maybe that'll work, maybe it won't. So they're all in individual cases. But... And I know this gets dicey, uh, it's very difficult conversations. Ultimately, I mean, you can talk about all the different tests, just like their personality profiles, you know, the Myers-Briggs and whatnot. There are a lot of different tests that you can take to show where a person's coming from. I can take the Myers-Briggs test five days a week and come out with five different answers. You know, you can game these things to a certain extent. And the ultimate choice is, there's no way to guarantee that somebody's not going to slip through the cracks. Now this is my, totally my personal thing. I don't happen to believe in the God on the cloud who throws lightning bolts and, and at his or her whim intervenes where he wants to. But I don't happen to believe that life ends when my body ends. I have no clue what happens after that. I just happen to think that whatever the I is of me continues in some form. I go back to where I came from. That's all I can say is I think I'm going to go back to where I came from. Okay, so there's that spiritual but not religious. Ultimately, yes, the physical is important. 
but it's not the ultimate of importance to me personally. And so I, I come to this, I deal every day with the, I'm not going to say probability, but a distinct possibility that I will get a phone call and my son has killed himself. I just happen to think that that's not the end of his existence. I think he simply is no longer limited by his physical body. And so it kind of dances around the answer to your question of how do you make sure that people don't slip through the cracks? There is no way you can make sure that people don't slip through the cracks, but I don't believe in legislating morality in order to make sure that a few people don't slip through the cracks. Well, but I have worked in mental health also, and depression can be controlled. Bipolar disorder can be controlled. Yeah, but can be cured. They're chronic brain diseases. Right, okay. But they can be controlled. Thank you for a yeah. quality of life, so I would be personally really concerned about people making the decision in their life because of depression without having it okay. evaluated, assessed, and treated. Okay. I totally agree with you, and thank you for bringing my focus back. If I could convince you that your depression can be totally controlled, and you say, yes, I get that, then what happens is your choice. If you choose not to be medicated, if you choose not to get help, that's what it comes down to. If you choose not to get help, we can be out here, I mean, we're in the professions we are because we care. God knows we're not in it for the money. We're in it because we care. But we can't talk you into things that you don't want to do. I refuse. So I can say, here, look, okay, here's, here are three options, and these are all make you feel great. Okay, the matrix, blue pill or red pill, which one do you want? It's your choice, what you're going to do. I can give you medication, she could direct you to people, well, I can't personally, but we can both direct you to people who will make you feel great, or at least will control your depression. Whether or not you do that is up to you. I refuse to say that you must be, that you must take these pills. And if at the end of the day you die because you're not taking these pills, I personally honor your choice. Whatever that choice is, to me it's always about individual choice because only you own your body. I'm sorry. That's, you know, I'm Are you saying that your organization would help somebody with depression or with bipolar? No, I'm so okay, I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. That's my personally one no. No, one of the things still going on with final exit network is that you must be mentally able to self-deliver. You must have the mental cognition and being able to do it still. Uh, I don't know if I have this. Well, somewhere in here, um, you do have to, uh, you have to be of sound mind to some extent. Now, what that definition is, it varies from state to state, from country to country. And who evaluate exactly? And who was the licensing board behind the people who did that? Thirty years ago, the, meta, the AMA tried to get tied to outlaw chiropractic. Now it's called osteopathy. You know, uh, and so to put a, an ultimate blanket ruling on all these things, I mean, here, I'm here. I hear where you're coming from. Uh, I studied PTSD because I thought I was going to fix my son. I learned now you don't fix them. You learn how to deal with. Addicts and depression. Yes, I'm. So didn't you come up to me that they have to provide you with documentation? Oh, thank you. Th that's that's what it is. And that came out of uh, camera where it was, but yeah, thank you. That came out of that case in in Arizona, because somebody was mentally ill, mm -hmm. and was not properly screened. Right. Okay. Okay. We fixed that issue. Now, are there other issues that may come up? From my perspective, as long as I'm living and breathing, I'm going to be making mistakes. So you fix that issue by now having people screened for mental health? We do a much better job of screening. I'm not one of the screeners, mm -hmm. by the way. I'm not one of them. I'm a counselor. I'm not, I'm not a mental health screener. I'm not a doctor. My, my master's degree is in, is in counseling. It's not medical. Yes? Okay, I'm not speaking for compassionate choices now. I'm speaking for me. This is what I believe. Whose business is it? Thank you. Yeah. If, I mean, and so what? If I am mentally ill, if I choose 
not to be here. That's my business. It isn't right. anyone else's. For me, it always comes down to I have no right to tell you what to do, period. It is somebody else's business because there is such a thing as mental health committals and substance abuse committals. And that's what would likely happen in those kinds of cases. According to, the, uh, well, excuse me, but according to the law, it's somebody else's business. Exactly. I according, I'm right. About that is the law in Iowa. Right. <laughs> I'm just saying, according to my own morality, it's not my business. Any yes, sir? Um, the conversation you have with family about end of life issues mm -hmm. is obviously hard to, to get going. And in my case, I've got sons who are in their 20s who I want to talk to about the mother who's about 80 and she's and, and siblings in between. Is there a tool such as a video that introduces this topic such that I, we could, I could provide it to each person, they could watch it, and then we say, okay, we're going to get together and talk. And something of that, a tool of that sort that helps yeah. them bring this topic. Yeah, shoot me an email, and I can direct you to it. As far as I'm concerned, any qualified counselor or therapist can provide you all kinds of ways to start any kind of a difficult conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I can't say that there's a canned answer to talk about end of life. Um, but those of us who work in hospice or have worked in ICUs, we've had those conversations. And uh, I can direct you to some resources. Uh, I'm sure uh, social workers are aware of resources like that out there, especially in Iowa. I'm from Minnesota, so I don't know what's available here. So I would be directing you to more general things. Well, I'm just talking about something general. I don't know if anyone else knows what's going in, but I mean, it seems like that would be a great thing just to introduce the topic and say, hey, we've got to get together and talk about a few of these things. Okay, let me ask you a question. You just said the words. We've got to get together and talk about some important things. Right. Make it an agenda item at your next family reunion. Hard as hell to do it at the time comes. <laughs> but if you prepare yourself and write your notes, exactly. that's why I said it's the most difficult but the most important conversation you'll ever have. Find the courage to do the difficult thing. I want somebody to give me the courage. <laughs> <laughs> God, God. Yeah, okay, great, great crowd for this. You've got to pray to the Lord Jesus to give you the courage, you know, my background. Um, I can tell you, I just had this conversation probably within the last two or three months with uh, my nephew, who's the person that I chose to be my representative. She has a son who's incapacitated. And it actually wasn't as difficult as you might think it's going to be. Because it, you have that loving relationship, and that's how I approached it. Is you are the person in my family that I trust the most with my feelings to honor what I want to do, and and that's how I started the conversation. Mm -hmm. So that he knew immediately you're the guy, you know, and I trust you completely. And then I just talked about it, and I showed him all the paperwork. I said this is what it is. I gave him copies. It actually went very well. I took care during the same period about my will and everything else, and I can tell you, speaking as an atheist, for me, when all of that was done, I thought, there's my afterlife, you know? Mm -hmm. That is my afterlife. I have completed it. I feel comfortable. I'm, I'm okay with it. You know, I'm 57 years old. I've had breast cancer, you know, so it, it, it was something that I really needed to do. And, and once it was done, it's One, one of the things that uh, you can, I mean, you can call me if you want to, but if you look under emotional intelligence, uh, that was a big deal in corporate. Now they call it mindfulness or whatever. Um, but a lot of that stuff is addressed in your question where it's how to have the difficult questions or the difficult conversations. And there are some really remarkably effective, simple phrases like, I have to tell you something really hard. Completely changes the energy. And they're totally wide open, as opposed to, get your butt here. We got to talk. Could be the same words after that, but I have to tell you something really hard. So thank you for that. You know, you're the person I trust the most. Oh, well, the, anything. What, what can I do for you? As opposed to, I'm dying and I want you to do this. It's like, why? You know? No, but having those basic introductory phrases, and I mean, shoot, shoot me an email, I'll send you a list of them, but you can go online and find things like how to start difficult conversations. And a lot of cat, you know, my favorites is 
now I have to say something hard. And usually it's a lot, whole lot harder for you than it is for them. Yes, sir. Um, the one hour video has been on public television several times called Being Mortal. There you go. If you've seen that, I mean, that's a, that's a great book. It's also a great book yeah. by Atul Gawande. Mm -hmm. um, and it's his dad had cancer. They had to have that uh, uh, discussion. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's really um, uh, a remarkable video. Everybody hear that? Being Mortal. Being Mortal. So oh, it's a frontline thing. By the way, there was a documentary, I think it's a frontline documentary on Final Exit Network, and it had the word assisted suicide in it, so you can read about the story of all the lawsuit cases and stuff. So anyway, I'm way over my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And I would like one final comment. I want to thank you for your service. What I like to say is, I don't have all the answers. The most important thing is that we have the conversation. So keep having the conversation. <laughs>